my personal brand, Oak Tree Consulting Coaching Hub, works with lots of different brands to bring the best type of coaching services we can for our clients and just for consumers that come and, and learn from us. So today we're going to focus on stress management part two. Uh, I did a seminar last week focusing on stress management and just overall understanding of different areas that impacts. And we had some takeaways and really focused on sleep hygiene. If you didn't find this, you can find a recording on YouTube by searching for Coaching Hub channel and I suggest you guys subscribe. But today we're going to focus on stress management and impact of stress on business productivity. You know, it's one of those things that science right now says one thing, but business is doing another thing. And this has happened in many times for many years. We use motivation for the longest time. And we talked about stick and carrot, right? You know, either promise a person something and reward them or scare them and they're going to, you know, do it out of fear. But then we realized intrinsic motivation was more important in this kind of vision and purpose, autonomy, mastery, all those different components. But those studies were done back in the 60s that proved that scientifically with candlestick studies and different, you know, I'm not going to get into that today. But similar stuff exists currently in what we should be doing in business and how our internal physiology, our blood chemistry, brain chemistry is impact, impacting our ability to be productive in order to be successful in business overall from decision making to risk taking to motivation. All of that is not just a psychological thing. It first starts chemically within our body and stress is one of the major disruptors that causes this problem. So in these webinars, guys, what I'm really focusing on is at Coaching Hub, we, tell, we take a tell, show, do approach. So we tell you about why it's important. You know, why is this such a, an important thing for you to learn about? Why is it such an important thing for you to invest time into? Then we show you how you can do that. Because in order to convince a person of something, you have to give them, you know, a reason why they need to do it and really showing them that and then show them that they can actually do it. And once those two components are there, then people can take action. And that's when the do component comes in with specific things that you have to implement that's custom tailored to your body, your needs and your lifestyle. So diving into agenda, a little bit introduction to myself, guys, every webinar, I think it's important. People I forget how Simon Sinek says, but it's something like people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So I think it's important for you guys to know who I am. And a lot of times it's not the same listener in a webinar. So I want to make sure that I'll cover that stress and brain chemistry. We'll discuss, like I said, decision-making motivation and risk-taking. We will talk about how to pace to avoid burnout. You know, it's a lot of things that I learned in the military and the Marine Corps that I'll discuss there and just some high level concepts. I'll introduce you guys to yoga and break down some of the stigmas out there that may exist. So maybe you feel more comfortable to try yoga or you try different formats of yoga that you may have not tried before that are more suitable to your needs. We'll discuss being present overall in everyday life. And then I'll leave you with introduction to meditation and my gift to you. Last time it was sleep hygiene. This time I'm going to send you one of my recorded uh, meditations. I'm a meditation coach, yoga instructor, and one of many hats that I wore in my life. And I was fortunate enough to be taught meditation by a Buddhist monk when my mom living, when I was living in Ukraine, when I was 12, took him in to live with us for exchange for food and shelter. And he taught me a lot of this stuff that I'll be uh, covering real quick today. So talking about myself, right? Who am I? Anton Chumak Andrikov, you guys can find me on LinkedIn, uh, create a lot of content out there. You can subscribe to YouTube channel for Coaching Hub. I don't really maintain my own. And then oaktree.live, www.oaktree.live is my website. You can go check out some stuff. Uh, I don't keep it too updated. It's kind of like a landing page and you can reach out to me directly. But a little bit about me, military is where, you know, I learned to be hardcore about stress. I learned to perceive stress the right way that allows me to have a high achiever mindset. And that's really who I cater to. I cater to people that are not trying to be average. And I'm not talking about everybody doesn't want to be average, right? But I'm talking about people that are putting in work daily. They're high, high crazy schedules. They expect the world out of themselves. They don't celebrate a victory unless it's monumental, you know, those kind of people. Uh, people like myself who were raised, they got all A's and one B. They weren't told good job. They were told, hey, you should have gotten all A's and pushed there. And that's just how I live now. And that's why I coach those folks. So that's where a lot of this was learned is in the military. This is my family. You know, that's my soul. That's my everything. My wife, my two kids. And I just had my newest born. I need to take a family picture with him. But he's about three weeks old. Uh, he's a, amazing. And then over there in the corner, I don't know if you can see behind my face, but it's a picture of my family. And it says changed. We all got baptized together a couple of years ago. It was my second time, but I want to do it as a family. 
And then that's my professional self. I worked for Lifetime for a long time. It's an amazing company and they are very innovative. And this is where I learned a lot of this physiology and then I learned how to apply it to business kind of on my own. And my mission is to help 10,000 or sorry, 10 million people to realize their potential by impacting their mind. And everything in their body is connected to their mind. So the whole being, that's really what I'm about, guys. So moving into it, stress in the brain, right? So what are some of the things that are going to be caused, are going to become a problem by chronic stress? We, last week, we discussed stress is not a horrible thing. We need stress response. But stress response is meant to be acute, right? Short-lived, it spikes, and then we have a little bit of increased performance and that's why it's a good thing but then it's supposed to go back down to where our body adrenal glands are able to recover and our cortisol production reduces comes back down and we're able to do that again when that situation occurs or a similar dangerous situation occurs but the problem with that in modern day life and especially with high achievers it is not acute it is chronic and the typical approach that most people take for stress management is back off, you know, breathe and, and meditate, which those are important components. Those are tools, right? Those are some of the tools. But I focus on a lot of tools with high achievers that can't back off, that can't take things off. I, I focus on input. How do we vary your input to maximize your output when it comes down to your body and your mind? And I'll discuss some of the strategies in this webinar and continual webinars. So our brain is our primary resource in business, guys. I mean, you can have the nicest technology, you can have the best trainers, the best systems, you name it, your business can be flourishing. But if your brain is not functioning how it's supposed to be functioning, you're going to have a problem. Those things are not going to matter. You're going to be not optimal. And that's where it's a problem. You know, in the Marine Corps, we were taught that it's not the rifle. It is the Marine that is the greatest weapon in the world. Because without that Marine, that rifle is just a tool. So without your brain, all those things that you have are just tools. But think about how much money and resources you spend on other tools but your brain goes malnourished, goes not you know, functioning properly and is not being given the attention the time it needs. Think about that. A fraction of a second in a slow down time of thoughts can cost us immense amount of time over a full day. You know, our brain neurons fire so fast that just the tiniest little slowdown makes a big difference. And that's what stress will do to us. You know, chronic stress creates negative changes for our neural networks. Your brain is just this beautiful neural connection. You know, half your brain is really gray matter and the other half is white matter. And that's where a lot of axons and brain neurons live and they're communicating, they're talking. And those pathways are able to be changed and modified positively. And they're also able to be changed and modified ne negatively, right? So positively is neuroplasticity. It's ability to make our brain be different and go from negative wiring to positive wiring. And I'm not going to get into that, but we all kind of talk about this with emotional intelligence and things like that. And then negative is going to be brain shrinkage. Stress causes brain shrinkage. It actually makes your brain smaller. And you can very, not without even knowing science, right? You can understand having a smaller brain is not going to be very good. You see this big old head, very proud of it. I, I love having a big head because I tell people it's my full brain in there. I don't know. It could be really small in there, just a lot of empty space, but we'll see. Um, so it hinders our memory, guys. And this one is funny because I think many of you can relate that are listening to this webinar, but you go to the grocery store, right? And you're there and you think, I got to get one thing real quick. I'm going to run in and I'm going to run out. And you walk out, say with four or five things, but you forgot the one thing that you came for, right? It, that kind of stuff starts to happen where you used to be really organized in your head and you could pull out information because neural work networks were proper and it was easily accessible to you. And now all of a sudden it doesn't become accessible because stress has hindered that ability. Has Stress has hindered your ability to remember things and communicate inside your head. So, Increased risk of men mental illness is another thing that we're going to face. And people are tying a lot of issues like Alzheimer's, ADHD, and Parkinson's, and, and many other uh, issues that are saying they're caused by stress. And that's not even getting into other health stuff that I talk about. I'm just talking about strictly brain. So it kills brain cells affecting memory, emotion, and learning. Those are the specific ones that are very targeted. So as business owners and executives and C-level folks that I usually work with, you know, do you think it's important to have your emotion in check? Yeah, maybe EQ has kind of become on the scene last 10 years as more important than our IQ. And in business, it really is true. You know, you, you think your learning ability is going to be important. Everybody talks about this learnability, new skill that you need to put on your resumes and how you're adaptable and able to learn in new environments. Well, guess what? Yeah, I think what we should put resilient to stress because without that, none of it's going to happen. And many of us are simply not. 
And I discuss in the future webinars, you know, how to improve that and stuff like that. So talking about here, I want to discuss neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters is something that is incredibly important and very little understood about it when it comes down to science. So what are neurotransmitters? I need you to first understand that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So what does that mean? We talked about last week the typical health model that United States takes, where we have three branches of health. You got Western medicine, you got naturopathic medicine, and you got your kind of root cause and preventative side of medicine. And a lot of people think health, it means that if I'm not taking medication, if I'm not diseased, I'm healthy. No, because there's quite a bit of a dis distance between being optimal, where your body's functional in its best capability, and being actually diagnosed with a, with a disease or having an actual problem. There's a lot of gray area there. And a lot of people feel that they're okay, but they don't know what okay even feels like anymore because they haven't had the contrast of actually what good feels like. It's been so long that they can't even compare. So that's why we need to understand that health is not just absence of disease. Health is being energetic, being able to make decisions well, being able to feel like you know, you're know you just whole. That's, that's what it is. That's how it feels like. You just feel like you're light and everything's great, right? And rainbows and unicorns are shooting everywhere, but it does. That really does. I'm being facetious, but that's really the truth. You know, so chemical imbalances in the brain can also cause a, cause a person to lose touch with reality, become compulsive, or having any number of other mental disorders, right? So do you guys think that losing touch with reality happens in business? Have you guys seen an executive or a manager that's been under massive amount of stress and they're trying to solve an issue and yet they're creating a bigger issue because they're, they're, they just don't see the problem. They see the problem from this wrong angle and they're not able to get out, of, get out of this box, right? They live in the box. If you're stressed and you need to be creative and you need to think outside the box, guys, it, it ain't just not, not going to happen. When you're stressed, your analytics, your creativity, all of that stuff shuts down. You're not going to be effective. So neurotransmitters play a major role in everyday life and functioning. Scientists do not yet know exactly how many neurotransmitters exist, but more than 100 chemical messengers have been identified. Guys, we know some of the common ones and some of the big ones, but how they're all interconnected in our brain, gut, chemistry, all that connection. There's so much we don't know. Like, honestly, that's one of the least like studied things that I would say is the connection between our brain, our gut, and all these neurotransmitters. Even though we spend a ton of time on it, just the amount of learning to be a you know, to happen there is like the abyss of the ocean. And we just beginning just to tap in there. So just because we don't understand the depth doesn't mean that we don't understand the severity of damage the stress causes on it. So as a preventative measure, guys, you want to protect your brain, don't be stressed out. Now, so what are some of these neurotransmitters affected by disease, drugs, chronic stress, poor nutrition, but all of those are going to be stressors on the body. If you're diseased, guess what? We, we, we're going to talk about this in the future, but that's an internal stressor. Your body is going to be oxidatively stressed because it's creating inflammation. It's creating free radicals and lots of different things like that. Drugs, no brainer. Put a chemical in your body that doesn't belong there. It's going to be stressed. Chronic stress of over schedules, whether it be, you know, you're not managing your relationships well, you don't create good work life balance and there's stuff going on at home. All this stuff is going to impact you. Poor nutrition, poor Put, put pure fuel into your Ferrari. Do you think it's going to go very well? No, it's going to stress us out. So the same thing's happening to your body. But we keep doing it because we're so disconnected from our future selves. Talked about that last week. So we discussed that there can be a number of different adverse effects on the body. So I already mentioned some of them, but diseases such as Alzheimer's, epilepsy, and Parkinson's. Dopamine is associated with such things as addiction and schizophrenia. Lack of focus and motivation, discipline. Right? Motivation and discipline, lack of focus, hmm, those probably pretty important for business. Those are probably pivotal for business. You can talk about all these different routines that people like to do in the morning and all this stuff, but the precursor to it is going to be good brain chemistry first. So serotonin plays a role in mood disorders and including depression and OCD. And one thing about many of these, when cortisol production goes up, which is your stress response, main hormone that your body do, uses to uh, control fight or flight response. When that goes up, many of these things go down. So your most importantly, serotonin has an inverse relationship with it. So that feeling of good and just wholesome and, and really being fulfilled goes down when we're stressed. So just understand that stress can elicit some dopamine and make you feel good for the short burst of time, but chronic stress is not going to do that. It's actually going to shut it down. So moving on stress and motivation, right? So we have 
kind of three main ones, uh, three main neurotransmitters trying to find where to put this thing to discuss. Basically, the first one, dopamine. That is going to be your alertness, your clarity, your ambiguity, motivation, um, working memory, passive, being passive, your appetite. All this stuff is going to be controlled by dopamine. And this is ultimately what makes you motivated. Most people think that motivation is this mystical thing that all of a sudden, boom, it spikes and I'm ready to go. No, it's actually very calculated. What your body does with dopamine is it's a precursor to get you ready for that activity and get you motivated to do it. So what your system's gonna scan is basically an activity that say you wanted to do, and maybe it's going to the gym. I wanna be motivated to go to the gym so I have good health and good focus at work. Cool, we know that that could be healthy. But when you wake up in the morning or you know at night when you're ready to go, before you go stop off at home, you're gonna stop at the gym, you're thinking, all right, I want to do this, and your body's gonna say, what is my workload and compare it to my reward that I'm going to get from this. Is this something that's going to be worth it or not? So if your body thinks that my dopamine is good, it's going to release it and it's going to feel like I want to go to the gym. But if not, then it's not going to release the right amount. Or if it's more released by the electronics and all the other stuff, you get burnt out. Your body may say, you know what? I can just get on my cell phone, get the same release. And it's way less work than that gym. So if we treat dopamine nice, it should be responding the right amount to make us go want to do what we should be doing. Whether it be work, you know, going to the gym, it doesn't matter. So once again, if that's not happening, you're going to have problems. Serotonin, we discussed relaxation, insomnia, pleasure, anxiety, learning memory, disability. So what we want to focus on there is not chronic stress, because when it gets chronic, like I said in our last slide, it's going to bring our serotonin down with that going up. So make sure that we take things to support it. I'm not going to get into this too much today because I want to give you high level of stuff, but there's things that we can do, supplements that we can take to support each one of these. Norepinephrine is another one that's focused on our attention. Um, I'm really familiar with this one because if you can't notice, I speak really fast and I actually have ADHD. If you see me fidgeting and moving around and stuff, I'm, I'm very you know, hyperactive as it is high energy, but I use it. I've learned how to manipulate it, but I have taken medication in the past that helps me with norepinephrine and it actually boosts it to make me more focused. So, but there's things we can do naturally that I've learned how to do, how to control it and regulate it to where I don't need it, or I don't need as much or a high of a dose of it. So guys, really what I'm talking about here is not about being perfect. It's not about having this outstanding system that you're doing and you're able to always be on top of everything. It's more about doing the best that you can with the situation that you're given. If you can back off and you can retire, guys, don't get me wrong, go retire because all the stuff that I talk about is not going to be as good as putting your feet in the sand and, you know, sipping the mojito or whatever it is you want to, you know, do. But if you can't, or the situation dictates otherwise, and you just can't take things off your plate, then you add things in. You add supplements that are going to help you produce more of the neurotransmitters that are A, maybe being burnt out, or B, are not being produced properly. You can take supplements to regulate stress to help. You know, we talked about that little guy in the boat that's always trying to dump the water out before it overflows last week. Well, to help that guy, there's things we can take supplementation that's one minute of your day and it supports it. It helps it helps him to you know get through it. It doesn't mean forever. You can't survive like you know, under chronic stress forever, but you can do things through the worst times to do that. So understand the other things that matter with motivation is your blood sugar. When your blood sugar is up, you're usually feeling good. Your body's like, all right, let's do this. Go have a bunch of spoons of sugar and see how you feel probably going to feel pretty good for a minute, but then it's going to crash out. And that's when you're not going to want to do stuff. Your body's motivation is impacted by this, not just from energy levels, but when your blood sugar fluctuates, testosterone and other hormones are impacted, which cortisol is one of them, it's a fight or flight energy generating hormone. Um, so you got to understand that eating regularly is not just good for weight loss. Eating regularly is really good for focus. So maintaining your blood sugar. But once again, everybody talks about three to five meals a day. That's ideal. Not necessarily. I can survive on two meals a day. Why? Because it became such a good fat burner. Once again, not going to get into this too much today, but there's ways that you can become a really good fat burner to where you don't need to eat frequently. I eat about 1500 calories in the morning and about 1500 calories at night. Not intermittent fasting. That's not the point. I just don't need it because I burn about 90% fat at rest. I manage my stress and I check my fat and, you know, intake and I check my macros, but more importantly, I test my fat through oxygen uh, testing and stuff like that. So because of that, I'm able to go a long time without food because my body's using very little of my stored blood sugar. But many of you, especially many of you that are stressed, your blood sugar is like this all day long. If you notice you're getting hangry, if you actually have no hunger at all, you probably have a blood sugar issue, whether it's high, whether it's low, whether it's fluctuating, all of those things are going to cause you 
cause you a problem. So understand what you eat impacts your stress, what you eat impacts your focus, what you eat impacts your energy. Of course, everybody understands that part. And overall, your primal drive, right? It said that the hormones are impacted by fluctuation of blood sugar and the same thing from the the same building blocks that are used to produce stress hormone are used to produce other many positive hormones. So imagine you had 10 of these building blocks to go around and it was supposed to be three for sex hormones, three for neural hormones, and four for stress hormones. And all of a sudden, those 10 building blocks are going to go eight for stress hormones and one for the other two. Well, guess what? You're going to have side effects and issues coming from that because you're overproducing stress response. So we need to bring that down to redistribute things back into the right you know, region to get that primal drive, that, that will to live, that enjoyment of life that I'm talking about. If you have, you know, you know, when you're good and you're not stressed, you know what I'm talking about. So moving into stress and decision making, you know, the way that our brain is wired, that has a lot to do with basically how we're going to respond in situation and more importantly whether we're going to respond in situation or we're going to react in a situation and if you've ever reacted you typically know that's not optimal you don't want to react we want to think about it we want to make a logical decision usually emotional decisions are more reactive and get us in trouble so we have our limbic system that lizard brain that people like to talk about that initial um part right at the bottom of our brain cortex down here. So your, your body, sorry, brainstem and your body's first impulses go through there. And if it's lit up, if it's fired up because you're under stress and you have danger in front of you, whether it be perceived danger from a lion or perceived danger because your body's stress response has been elevated for so long, your body thinks you've been chased by a lion, your survival instinct kicks in, right? So it's not time for you to sit here and get your logic and prefrontal cortex to turn on. It's going to be time to survive. So your brain's going to make very quick and impulsive, instinctive decisions. Your animal side, which is very fear-based, very, you know, just this stuff that we don't like about humans typically and aggressive, right? So that's what you're going to fire up. And before the signal is able to get to prefrontal cortex, where you're going to be more calm and logical, you're going to make most likely a wrong decision. And it's not going to be a matter of survival or death. You're just sitting at work with an over busy schedule in a meeting. And now you had an emotional outburst or you, you know, rolled your eyes at somebody and guys, people that are stressed out, roll their eyes more than non-stressed out people. Trust me, emotional intelligence goes down massively. So understand limbic system, instinctual program reaction, frontal cortex, logical chosen response. I don't know about you, but I want to be choosing how I respond to people, not having my brain choose for me automatically. So don't give up your human power of choice, guys. This is why it's important to invest time into stress management. Like I told you, I'm here to convince you why you need to do this. So imagine how many mistakes you've made in your life and how much time that actually cost you, whether it be a bad decision on a project or even choosing the wrong job or, or taking something too soon and not waiting on it, whatever it may be, it could have been years of decisions that cost you that much time. But had you dedicated 20 minutes or something like that a day to meditation or even less, we can find alternative methods for you for once or twice a week. Um, how much time are you going to save? This is logic, guys. I'm not trying to appeal to your emotional side. I can prove to you how you can save time and invest enough into yourself to manage your stress to be better throughout your everyday life. So do not decide with fear, guys. Nobody wants this red part. We want this nice blue part to be working all the time. So stress, stress and risk taking. We're pretty familiar that as entrepreneurs, we need to take risk. It's, it's an important and vital part of life. And there's two things that are going to happen with stress. We're going to increase our negative risk taking and we're going to decrease our positive risk taking. So with positive risk taking, we're going to have fear of failure. We're not going to want to take chances because of that next part, the fixed mindset. When we are very stressed, our body's not very, it's not very positive, right? We don't have this belief in ourselves to be anything we want to be and have this growth mindset everybody talks about and preaches about that is also chemically driven. But what's going to happen at that point, we're going to have this fixed mindset where we can't be something more. We are what we are. So because of that, we're afraid to fail. We're afraid to take that next step because now it may just, you know, 
dis disposes to everybody in the world and show us that we're a fake or we're really pretending to be something we're not, and we're really not as smart as we are. That's what a fixed mindset does. And then the other thing that it does, is it causes hesitation. It causes us to hesitate and not make decisions. And, and I don't know about you, but in the military and in business, I learned that hesitation kills. You know, ask for, uh, ask for forgiveness, not for permission is something that was taught in business long ago, because those initiative takers, those, those trend centers are the people that get there first and they're going to be the most successful. Everybody else is going to be picking up crumbs. Don't be the one picking up crumbs. So you need to manage your stress. So other negative risk taking are going to happen. Gambling. You know, you're going to be taking gambles because of that fixed mindset, right? You got to get a quick, get rich, quick scheme versus knowing that by putting in the work and taking the proper steps, you're almost guaranteed to get there. Drug use experimentation, right? A lot of stressed people, cocaine becomes a really, really popular drug, not just because of sleep deprivation, but because it's just something that our brain wants to do. And adultery, you know, another one of those risks that usually starts to happen when people are stressed out. Definitely avoid that. We're not even getting into the... Uh, ethical, you know, sides of any of those just simply not good for you. are not going to cause you a positive life. So some corrective actions, right? You want to get into that's why that's important. And I'm always going to give you a little bit of a trickle down on what you need to do. But high achievers may not succeed with common approach, right? Common approach to stress management is usually exercise. If I would say out of everybody I talked to about stress, which is thousands of people, you know, over my 14, 14 years of doing this, I guess, no, it's 13, something like that. But what happens is everybody thinks, okay, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to make myself feel better because my body released endorphins and I'm going to feel good. And I cleared my head a little bit. But that's because we think about stress most commonly as mental stress. We don't think about internal stress. We don't think about physical stress, oxidative stress and stuff like that. But exercise is kind of tricky. You should exercise to manage stress, but specific exercise, duration of exercise, intensity of exercise, timing of exercise, all going to matter. Discussed a little bit of this last week. But because this is the most common one, I just want to address that it's not going to always be the best one maybe for you. We were not meant to work out. You know, we were a hunting and gathering society. Just think about human beings before we became a civilization. We were meant to run away from things. So when your heart rate is elevated for 20 minutes or greater, usually around 40 minute time, actually, to be exact, your cortisol spikes because your body thinks I've been running away from something for this long. I need more energy now. I need an increase in my performance to be able to get away from this animal that's chasing me because why else would we be running, right? That the, the body doesn't understand. I got to work and run. So I'm not fat. I got to run. So I have good energy. I got to, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, so then your cortisol goes up. So we're trying to bring stress down, but after 40 minutes, we're creating a spike. So clearing your head does not mean de-stressing your body. It just means that you kind of cleared your thoughts. Yes, it's good, but there's alternative ways to do that that don't have the detrimental effects on your body that some wrong exercise does. So once again, not here to get into deep detail. I'll cover that in my future uh, webinars, but this is just why you can't just think just because I'm making myself feel better in the moment, I'm actually managing my stress. Long term, you're going to cause a bigger problem. Moving on. So understanding pacing. I'm going to cover this very high level and I may lose you guys questions. Hopefully, if you have any questions, type them in and I will see them at the end for the Q&A and I'll be able to answer them. So if anything I've covered so far or anything that you see in upcoming slides, because I'm talking so fast, you need more clarity, or you just have something that popped into your head, something you heard, you need something, you, know, you need answers to, then just pop it in and I'll answer at the end. But anyway, so in the military, right? Everything we did, we did at 100%. You didn't do anything at less than 100% performance. I don't care if you woke up in the morning, and you had to get dressed. I don't care if you had to go march and ch uh, to the chow hall, a place that you eat. And everything was done in formation. Everything was perfect. Why? because that's what we were trained to do and we were used to it. So we would go out on 30 day training missions. We'd go out to Iraq for seven months, right? And, and these kind of long and long stressful deployments, but didn't burn out, why? Because we were constantly in that high performance state, we got used to it. Now, I think long-term, yes, it causes problems. So there's gotta be a happy balance and I'll talk about that in a sec. But we burn out not due to where we perform most of the time, 
we burn out in business because of the contrast between when we push at 100% and when we kind of coast. And we've all been there. We've all, whether you're in sales, which is a lot of folks that I talk to, you know, you got that sales cycle and you got your end of the month closeout, mid-month closeout, whatever it may be, or just in life, right? We, we kind of coast and we don't do the right thing for a while. And then we put a lot of pressure on yourself and we go real hard and we catch up and we're able to do what we needed to do. Everybody's probably guilty of this. I know I am. I create intentional procrastination to not second guess myself sometimes, but it's all measured in, in, in short term. So solution is not to go from 20, you know, from 100 to 25 and back and forth. The longer that distance, the more burnout you're going to feel, the more variance between where you perform at your high and when you perform at your low, the more, the more you're going to feel. And guys, I'm not talking about average people. I'm talking about high achievers here. So people that can't really take things off. If you retire and you stop doing everything and all you do is meditate all day, that's better, but that's not an option for you. That's not why you got on this webinar. So solution is to consistently operate 90%. And keep 10% for yourself to keep your gas tank full. I used to work when I was a trainer, I used to work a lot with mothers. Uh, for some reason, I love working with women in particular because I like to use health and fitness to strengthen their minds and, and just make them believe in themselves more. And that's where identity coaching really started for me many, many, many years ago. But Here's the analogy that I use. I talk about this probably in every web stress, you know, stress webinar or even conversation that I have. But right now you have a five gallon gas tank and you're operating at 100% of the output of that five gallon. Great, you're a giver. You're giving 100% of yourself. I love you for it, guys. And, and, I, and I truly do because givers make this world go around. This is not a taker's world. We gotta become givers. But here's the issue. If you keep giving 100% of that five gallon tank, we talked about brain shrinkage it's gonna start to shrink. And instead of having a five gallon gas tank, five years, 10 years down the road, whatever your stress capacity may be, you're gonna shrink it to one gallon. You're still giving away 100%, good for you, you're a giver. But logically speaking, you're giving 100% of one gallon where before you were given 100% of five gallons. So how do we maintain efficiency? We keep 10% for ourselves, focus on health, focus on you know personal time, focusing on work-life balance, whatever it may be, uh, but more importantly, treating your physiology, treating your body like a Ferrari that it is. So by doing that, we can consistently keep giving 90% of that five gallon tank for the rest of our life. My father didn't grasp that and it passed away at a really young age and that's why I you know, pushed stress management so hard. Died at 45, what if we just kept doing only 90% of the 100% he was doing, and now for another 40 years he could have been doing? Long speaking, do you think he would have been ahead? Heck yes, he would have been ahead. He was just getting into his better years. It's sad, but that's just life, and it's happening to so many people. So main types of yoga, getting a little bit into some of the main ones. Guys, there's so many subsets of yoga that I'm, I can't cover them all, but I want to talk about three main categories. So you have Ashtanga and Bikram. It's a rigorous style of yoga. Usually Bikram is heated super high. A lot of A-type personalities like this because they like the routine aspect of it. So if you're one of those people that likes routine, you like to follow a specific sequence of postures where like in Ashtanga, there's 26 that are repeated every single time, every single day. It's the same order, same way, same hold, same everything. And you just keep improving deeper and better holds. So perform exact same order each class. If you like that, take a stronger. If you want to push your limits and sweat it out and be this, you know, A-type personality that enjoys a challenge and, you know, thrives in that environment, Bikram may be for you. you. Might get beat with a stick, but I'm just kidding, but it's really strict. So then you have Hatha and Vinyasa. Those are more known for their fluid movement and intensive practices. So you can still get a really great workout because they're constant movement. It's connection of breath to movement that is very soothing and meditative in the body and actually does great cardio. You can, you can substitute some of the cardio that you do, some of your gym junkies, and you can actually do Hatha and Vinyasa yoga. And as long as you're matching one breath to one movement, you can succeed and be able to get the benefit of cardio as you do for meditation and stretching and flexibility from, uh, from yoga at the same time. So transition from one pose to another with the intention of linking breath to movement. No two classes are the same. They're always changing them up. Instructors usually come up with a new class. There's a general sequence and a parameter that they focus on, but they usually like to throw in different poses. This is where I teach. I like a lot of Hatha and Vinyasa practices. I teach usually a power style, you know, hot yoga format for those personalities that need to push themselves to actually shut off. And in a future webinar, I'll discuss that. Restorative yin yoga 
is different. This is going to be non-muscular bearing. So for some of you that don't like the burn or don't want to feel a deep like stretch that's really painful or don't like the endurance aspect of yoga, this is perfect for you. This is the other side that I teach that is very meditative. You may just come into a twist and hold it for a very long period of time. So it's great for relaxation, very passive connective tissue focus class that doesn't just address muscle, but kind of deep rooted connective tissue and often utilizes props. So these props like blankets, blocks, straps, assist you to kind of be more comfortable and allow you to get deeper into a pose. So you can hold it for five minutes at a time, but in comfort. One of the people I used to have in my class literally came in and took a nap for an hour every single time. And I was cool with it because it doesn't matter if you show up to a mat, most instructors, just about every instructor is going to be all right with you because they know that just by being in that environment, you're helping yourself. And the one thing about yoga, guys, that I'm going to tell you, it's your practice. It's not the instructor's practice. They're there as a guide. We are just simply guides to say, here's a suggestion for today practice. But at any time, you can modify movements. You can change movements. You can just lay on the mat. I remember when I was going through yoga teacher training, and if I was sick that day, the instructor just told me, hey, you're coming to class, but you're just going to lay here. You're just going to meditate. You're going to be with us, but you're not going to do anything. So just show up. Getting into the next thing, and it's getting to an end here, but being present. So this is where a lot of times of focus, I, Anton, I don't have time to meditate. I can't add that into my day. That's an excuse for one, but okay. I don't need you to do that yet. I can help you find out to a create time, but first I'm going to sell you on why that time becomes important. That excuse won't go away, but the past is history, the future mystery and the now is a gift and that's why we call it present guys this is not my quote i can't remember who this came from but just been ingrained in my head there's many versions of this out there but guys tomorrow may never come yesterday's already gone all you can do is focus on the now but guess what you don't your phones our technology our schedules our to-do lists our general psychology overstimulation takes us away from the present moment it takes us elsewhere so the best way to be mindful and to be, you know, be present is to simply find opportunities within your day to do that. So tips on that, when you eat, just eat guys, stop being on your phone when you're eating, stop thinking about what's to come, stop, stop always trying to, you know, create dual purpose lunches or whatever, sit down and enjoy your food, maybe even count, can you count to 25 chews before you swallow that food, feel the texture, feel, think about everything that's going on, that'll make you present, be aware inner and outer environments, right? A lot of times our outer environment is chaotic and that's fine because as long as the inner environment is not matching the outer environment, we don't have to be out of control. And that's what you can do. You can come inside when the outside is chaotic. Yes, it's thought through meditation, but sometimes breath work, simply slowing down and taking a few deep breaths. Right now, sit here and take a deep inhale to the nose. Fill up your belly. Don't breathe up here at the chest. Fill up as much as you can at the diaphragm and then take a five second, nice deep exhale. And then again, belly, 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 belly. Relax instantly. Feel shoulders come down, body relaxes. You can create those moments just for a minute throughout the day and your productivity will increase drastically just from that. Be amazed by the ordinary, guys. One of the things that is really hard to do, like I told you, when serotonin goes up, we discussed that cortisol goes down and when serotonin comes down, cortisol goes up and vice versa, right? So when we are amazed and we just see beauty and sunshine, beauty and a leaf on a tree, and we think about how cool it is that nature is able to do that. How cool is it that we're able to breathe and we never think about it. all the autonomous functions that our body does. You start being amazed by that your mood changes right away. You start being more present. You start looking around and going, wow, look at all this cool stuff. Electronic breaks. I understand high achievers don't have a lot of time to do that, but guys, just once in a while, at least do not wake up with your phone. You can have the alarm, but please don't do this right away. Don't get on social media. Don't get on emails. Don't do anything. Stay away from electronics for the first hour of your day. Please try it. It'll help you immensely. Center ground before conversations, right? So you know you're going into a big meeting, whether it be breathing, whether it be just thinking about your thoughts, but just kind of settling down before you step into that room. You may even think about powering, you know, practicing a power posture. All of those techniques are ultimately fundamentally a way to center and ground ourselves before we start that conversation, before we start that presentation. Say no. Simply say no. You're overscheduled. Guys, the most successful people know that they need to say no to 99% of the things to say yes to the 1% that is meant exactly for them, that's going to make it the most money, that's going to make it most success, whatever it is that you're after, the most impact. 
concept of flow. So flow is not new. Flow has been discussed in many different ways, but flow is something that is being actually studied in science. Now, Red Bull's doing a lot there, pioneering um, a lot of research there, but flow will not occur if you're not present because what flow does is flow turns off all the things that are not important to you that at moment. Think about like a professional athlete that is, usually extreme sports, right? Like dirt bike uh, racers and do these crazy backflips and stuff like that. Those guys, a lot of times complete the race and they can't remember some of the stuff that happened. They're just so in the moment. They're so zoned out. A lot of sports psychologists focus on this. But if in business this happens, anybody ever sit down and start a report or doing something and you're just moving, you're cruising and time is flying by and this thing is smooth as butter and it's amazing. And there's other times you just doesn't matter what you do, no matter what you can, you can't put two words together to strain a sentence uh, to make it you know, worth something. So that's all stress. That's what it does. And it's going to keep you from a state of flow. And if you know how much time a state of flow can save you for your creative or not or analytical, that's how you buy time for stress. By being more in a state of flow, you'll open up tenfold of what you spend on stress, managing stress, I should say. All right. So getting into, uh, Introduction to meditation. So different, we talked about different types of yoga, but now we need to understand there's different types of meditations and some are easier to start and some are harder and some are easier for some people and some are harder for some people. So you need to do what works for you and start in the easiest way possible and then see the benefit. And once again, then the body's going to think, okay, this activity is worth it. Now I'm more motivated to do it. So there's guided meditation. That's usually the one that either guided meditation or mindfulness meditation that I try to push people into. The one that I'll send you as a gift for being registered on this webinar will be a clip of my guided meditation. You just basically, one of the easiest to do, you tune out while listening to someone speak. Usually there's music, ocean, you know, whatever it may be, rain, and somebody talking. You're just visualizing, you're listening to their direction, you're getting yourself inside your body. And guess what you're not doing when you're doing that? You're not thinking about what's to come tomorrow. You're not thinking about what happened earlier. You're not stressed about your kids, blah, 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 blah. You're not thinking about, you know, this goal, you got to meet this deadline, whatever it is. It's just taking you out of this monkey brain that you're in all the time and allowing you to slow down just for a little bit. That creates a little reset for your brain, a little rest. And it's great before sleep. Transcendental meditation. This has become really popular. It's probably most studied form of meditation. And it's a chant a mantra or a personalized phrase. So when I learned meditation initially from the Buddhist monk, it was transcendental meditation. He sat with a practice with me and he determined my particular mantra. It was a combination of two syllables, uh, or sorry, two syllables, two, uh, what is the word that I'm looking for? God, I'm trying to uh, brain fart. Letters, two letters, sorry. Uh, it requires a teacher or a guide though to help you through this, to understand, teach you and, and find your mantras and things like that. So it's a lot more time invested, but there's coaches out there. Don't reach out to me for this, guys. This is, I'm not a specialist in this area. I would refer you to so many people that are I'm more of a generalist with meditation than a specialist. But when it comes down to them, they can sit there and really make you feel comfortable, really make you understand the effects, and really teach you how to implement it piece by piece. Once in my life, I was able to achieve a state of that true tranquility. And I'll give you a little story, and it may not be the same way for you. I was sitting in a complete dark room. I was 12 years old. And I'll remember this vividly. And it was on my balcony, but we converted it into a bedroom. It's just what you did in Ukraine for space and apartments. And what happened is I sat in darkness and all of a sudden I saw a tiny little speck of light way in the distance and my, you know, my eyes were closed. And all of a sudden I just came closer and closer into the light until I stepped into it. And I was in this white space. There was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. It was the most peaceful, amazing experience. I was, I don't know if it was there for a minute, second an hour i have no clue and i went to my teacher i discussed and it's like anton that's nirvana that's that's what people search for for years and he said because i was so young that i was able to achieve it easier and i think that it has a lot to do with stress it has a lot to do with our brain wiring in a certain way that is not impacted when we we're young as much as when we get old and everything that we go through so focus meditation does not require assistance or technology focus on one of the senses for prolonged times can be challenging for beginners, right? So you can listen to a sound, you can visualize something, sometimes just sitting down and watching the fire. One of my favorite focus meditations is actually, you know, go into the nature, create a little fire, or even in a backyard or a fireplace and just watch fire. It, it's amazing. You really get lost in it. And once again, you're not thinking about the other stuff. And then last but not least is going to be mindfulness meditation. So 
present and aware of thoughts. You can, can do things like prayer. Prayer is a form of mindfulness meditation. It doesn't matter what your God and what entity you, you, know, you pray to. If you're an atheist, it can be just you know, awareness of thoughts. You're just sitting there. And the best way I can think, like, describe this is if you were to watch your thoughts like you watch something through a mirror outside or through a window outside. You see everything happening, but you can't control it, which means that you shouldn't attach emotion or feeling to it. You're just observing them flow by, allowing one thought to replace the other and not attaching. And that's really important. That's what helps you to manage your stress. And there's movement meditation. This one may be better for some people. If you can't sit still like me, if you see me twisting around and fidgeting, uh, there's movement meditation. And movement meditation is going to be, uh, I was taught the walking one. So you're basically, or, or yoga too. So where you're really thinking about the connection of your body, you get inside your system. And a lot of times I teach people to practice yoga with their eyes closed just to turn off one of the senses to get inside yourself more. So thinking about, okay, I'm stepping through, my heel is striking, my foot is stepping, I'm planting. And really even you can talk through it or you can in your head talk through it. But guess what you're doing? You're not thinking about all the other stuff that you're always thinking about and you're recovering your body. So observance, but non-attachment of those thoughts. So this is a little bit of meditation, guys. Um, that's really it for what I have for you today. Right on the dot. Look at that, 45 minutes. I'm better, better today than I was last week. I was off by a few. But I want to open up to Q&A. If anybody has any questions, guys, let me know. Um, you can either raise your hand or you can uh, type out a question, either or. Hold on, I got a question coming through. Oh, I'll cover how you can reach out to me on the next slide and meditate. Guys, just Google, uh, Google meditation. Like literally you'll find meditation in all around you in your city, Google maps. It happens. Lots of different coaches. You can be coached for meditation remotely, but I always say there's something about a human bond and it's really important. So I, I, if you could do meditation coaching in person, I, I would recommend that. So look it up and find, uh, find some. If you want some to be referred to, reach out to me in email, and I have some that can do this remotely. They're amazing. But I, like I said, I recommend in person. Um, type of exercise that is ideal for business people. Um, that one is, there's no clear-cut answer, but it's more determined by the way that your body responds right now. Um, so if your system is say stressed at night, just make sure that you're not doing high intensity exercise at night. So yoga may be a good thing at night, but not a, a you know, CrossFit workout or a long run. But if you're tired in the morning, that may be something you should do then and do more of an intense workout to boost your cortisol to signal to your system. But we do want that fight or flight and coast it out into the evening. No. So caffeine is another one of those things that, um, Yes, I understand caffeine has gotten a bad rep. Caffeine's not bad for you unless you need it, guys. That's the catch-22 because caffeine is actually a powerful antioxidant. Coffee is a powerful antioxidant. Um, but the problem is if you need it, it means your adrenal glands are taxed and you're going to tax them more by having coffee. Yes, I do work with organizations. Um, so what I do in organizations is basically stress management, but it's a lot more deeper than that. We, we really focus on optimizing the complete human whether it be motivation and coming, teaching them intrinsic motivation, but we can even come in and do an assessment on your organization where we do a four point dermal cortisol test through my company. We can uh, purchase this test and you basically spit into a tube in four different parts of the day. And we're able to see at what point in the day are you able to uh, have better analytics? At what point in the day are you able to be more creative? At what point in the day you should make decisions? And we're able to help I'm able to help organizations to structure the day properly. Now, if you can't change your day to match your pattern, we shift your pattern through changing exercise, lots of different stress management techniques and supplementation to match the need of the day. And this is incredibly important. Uh, Dan Pink talks a lot about this in his book, When, but he talks about some natural patterns, but I go deeper than that. I actually bring in science and measure everything and able to change it. Um, another question, I have a question that sometimes the things become so urgent to get completed at the same time and to think to complete them as soon as possible to not miss the deadline because so much stress. Prioritizing becomes hard work. How to make that easy? Um, all right, guys. So how you do that is prioritizing time. And, and what I would say, you have to look at it as a, there is a, uh, like an X, Y axis. On, on your X axis, you're going to have not urgent and urgent. On the Y axis, 
practice you're going to have important and not important. The problem is what you're talking about is where most people feel like they need to be all the time and they're addressing things that are urgent and important, but that's what causes stress. It's that always in that fight or flight. But why is that happening? The reason that happens is because we've spent too much time in not urgent and not important, wasting time on, say, television or excess technology use, or we wasted too much time in in uh, not urgent, but or sorry, not important, but seeming urgent, right? And some things seem like they're important, take up a lot of our time, where in reality, they're not. One of those is going to be worrying about things we can't control. You know, it, a lot of our stress comes from stuff that we can't do anything about. In the future webinar, I'm going to cover my three bucket analogy to help people manage this a little bit better. I'll dive into more. Um, but it's because we always feel like we got to be, everything's important, right? And we can control everything. Then we feel like we can do something about it and we should be worried about it. And once again, that's taken because we can't actually do anything about it and we're wasting time on it. So where should you really spend most of your time? It's going to be in that second quadrant where it's important, but it's not yet urgent because you're addressing it because before it became a full on, you know, emergency. And usually that's when we're going to be more logical. We talked about brain response. If everything's urgent, you're going to be reactive. If you're addressing things before they became urgent, now you're going to be more responsive. So that's how you do it. You block things out in this quadrants and you write them out. You really plot them out. Okay, what am I worried about right now? Where does this go? Okay, check, check, check. And you can literally cross off the things in your mind that are preoccupying your thoughts and replace them with the right ones out there. So I hope that answers your question. All right, guys, if you don't have any more questions, that looks like that was the last one. Um, I'll close this out with final thoughts. So what we're looking at here is takeaway is going to be my guided meditation. I want you to try this for seven days in a row. I will send you one of my recordings and it's just going to be my, me talking and using some of my meditation techniques and it'll be guided one to specifically focus on relaxation before bed. But you can use it in other times too, but I suggest before bed, lay down, put your headphones on, turn off the lights. If you have to put a you know little mask on your eyes, uh, do that. Try to not be distracted by your family and be ready to fall asleep um, and straight into it. If you fall asleep, great. If not, then hopefully soon after it's done, you will. Next week's webinar will focus on stress and our personal life. You know, so I'll discuss things like weight gain, weight loss, um, relationships, um, socialization, networking, and things like that. I'll discuss polyvagal nerve theory, which has a lot to do with many of those things. On the following week, on the 20th, I am going to have a paid webinar. So basically, guys, how I do this, and, and guys, this is a job, so I, I give as much as I can, and hopefully you realize how much value you've gotten over these last two and the next one. But got wife and three kids, you know, and got to pay the bills. But I do this really affordable because I know that webinars allow me to reach a lot of people. So I don't try to, you know, rip anybody off. It'll be a price point that you can afford, uh, but it'll actually focus a lot more on the do. I'll really give you a lot more tools that you can do. Some of the stuff that I cover now, in addition to other things with much more detail. Uh, the webinar link is right there. Obviously, you can't click on it, but you can type it in and be able to go register for it. The registration's um, going to be set up. And then you can, I can be reached at oaktree.live. If you have any coaching you need, you or your organization, if you want to just discuss with me where you can take this and how internal stress and overall just our identity and, and, and it's a performance impacts our business or organizational business, just reach out, guys. I, I just want to have a conversation. First, conversation is always free and you can learn just a lot from that. All right, guys, that's all, that's all I got for you. And, you know, I can't wait to see you guys in the future webinar. Have a good day, everybody, and good night, wherever you are.